the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Feasts in ancient Judea observed a twofold pattern of invitation. A host would send an initial invitation, similar to our convention of a save the date, and those invited would signal their intention to attend so that the feast could be adequately prepared. When all was ready, a second invitation would inform the attendees that the feast was ready to begin. The invitation created a relationship of trust between the host and the guest. The guests could expect the host to provide generously, while the host could expect the guests to respond diligently. This reciprocal relationship incarnated the spiritual sense of shalom, or peace, an experience of gift and gratitude in a life shared together. Feasts were liturgical meals commanded by God to commemorate pivotal moments of deliverance and blessing in the history of the people and in the weekly remembrance of the Sabbath. Feasts were moments in the flow of the week and the year when neighbors were reoriented toward one another in an economy of feasts given and feasts enjoyed. The feasts were ritualized to provide a stable framework for relationship and the practice of generous creativity as a living reminder of God's goodness. Such meals also became opportunities for generosity to the poor and to strangers, an opening of the home for the sake of neighborly love, an expression of the goodwill of God to the people both anciently and in their own time. And in this way, feasts were intended to be a mode of evangelism and a mode of communal formation. Jesus gave the parable of the great feast at what should have been one such Sabbath supper, Earlier in the dinner conversation, Jesus had critiqued his Pharisee hosts for their incessant desire for places of honor at such feasts, a correction that they had dismissed under the guise of a polite religiosity. And so Jesus gave them a second parable, one about missing the essence of God's goodness because of pious and distracting self-interest. In the parable, the guests invited to the feast fail to respond with gratitude to the host's hospitality after he had paid the price and labored to prepare a good place for them at his table. And in light of this ingratitude, the host revokes their invitations and extends the privilege to increasingly broad and unlikely groups of people as a sign of his goodwill to feast those who will actually respond by coming. The warning message of the parable to those gathered is that it is possible to miss out on the kingdom and the Lord's goodness if one lives with pious intention but fails to follow through when the Lord actually comes and calls upon us to do what he asks. As traditionally oriented Christians, this is a parable of warning for us as well. We can easily imagine ourselves to be those whose invitation to the great feast is all but secured, who have received our sacraments, so to speak, and who need no further formation. And to be sure, we've received something very precious. In the Christian year thus far, we've witnessed the extending of that initial invitation in the Lord's ministry and in his call to repentance. And then we saw the profound cost and labor expended in his, in his passion to make all things ready for us to attend his feast. Now that table is set, and what remains for us is to be ready for the call and to attend the feast with gratitude. We can never forget what a necessity and privilege it is to receive a foretaste of that great feast made available to us 
weekly in Holy Communion every Sunday. There we are reoriented toward the feast as often as we gather to worship the Lord in the feast of the Eucharist. Every Mass we receive that gracious invitation to come, after which we are sent out into our week, but with a good hope of returning again to the Lord's feast again. We are formed in this way, to anticipate the great feast and to order our lives around it, provided, of course, that we actually attend and avoid being waylaid by the extracurriculars of life that are good but are of secondary importance. The great feast, though, can seem intangibly far away, even if it is anticipated in our weekly worship. How can we be confident that we are making ready for the feast? The lessons for today are clear that our Eucharistic worship remains incomplete unless after receiving the loving goodness of God, we then go out to love like God as we have been loved by God. That we are progressing to the great feast is assured only by the active practice of love in community in the imitation of Christ. As St. John writes, quote, as he is, so are we in this world. To love with a free and good will made possible by receiving Christ conforms our lives to the diligence and gratitude of Eucharistic guests. The grace of Eucharist, of course, lacks nothing because the Lord himself is present there. But the grace of Eucharist is consummated in our lives as we then live out the same self-giving love for others that we receive from the Lord in the sacrament. And this orients us to the practice of diligent love for other people. Here, we might observe a paradox of the Christian life. Every Christian is both solitary and in community. The Lord's feast is the end that we must each pursue as though it were the only thing there is and as though we are the only ones pursuing it. At the same time, we must always do so with a continuous and attentive compassion for our brothers and sisters in the church. We cannot be made perfect in devotion for God without also being made perfect in our sacrificial love for others. As St. John says in the epistle, quote, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then again, quote, By this we know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. We cannot be confident that we love God unless we are also committed to the slow and difficult formation in love for those with whom God has called us into the formational crucibles of the parish, the family, and the community. It is here where we are perfected in love, not some imagined out there or over yonder. It is here that we will be perfected in this sanctifying love or nowhere at all. The gospel warns us, though, against accepting with enthusiasm the initial invitation and then failing to attend the feast when the time comes. As St. John says again, quote, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Our good intentions are important, but they are not sufficient. We must embody them eventually in works of love. This begins with the ritual work we do as the people of God in the liturgy and in the daily offices of prayer, by which we are brought together in a formal pattern of giving and receiving before God and with each other. We are scripted in what it looks like to live in love for God and for neighbor. But this work of formal love 
extends outward into the informal ways that we are called to be attentive to the needs of our brethren and even the stranger and to be hospitable and generous to them. Self-giving love, in the end, is the measure of our faith. And especially as it applies to those in our lives that it is a challenge to love. As Jesus said in the Gospel of St. Matthew, if you only love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And as Dorothy Day once observed, quote, I only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. Love that fails to follow through by staying put when it is difficult is mere romanticism. And that is not the gospel of the cross, and it is not the way of the Christian. We cannot say that we want to attend the feast of Jesus Christ at the end and then neglect to walk the only road that will lead us to it. Before the resurrection, there is always the cross. Each of us knows, however, that within us there is a dividing line between the ways we are practicing the life of Christian love and the ways that we are not. Our conscience the voice in the heart that God has given each of us as a kind of inward disciplinarian prods us with reminders of how we have been lax in love or that we have even outrightly refused to love. And in light of the gospel's warning today, that should rightly concern us. But at the same time, that concern should never convert to despair. As Christians, we are welcomed into a life of self-examination and disciplined growth, but we are not welcomed into a life of skeptical crisis about whether or not we are really saved. The reminders of our frailties in love are for our humility, a spur to bring us back to Jesus Christ to seek his help and healing. We can only give, after all, the love that we have received. And our frailties are opportunities for us to receive more of the Father's love in Christ, that we might be vessels expanded to give that love to others. Thus, St. John reminds us, quote, If our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and he knows all things. Beneath that chiding voice of the conscience is the Spirit of God, who bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, by whom we cry out to God as Abba and Father. God himself reveals in the deepest places of the heart that he is our Father and that he will always love us. Even when we fail in love and refuse to love, the Lord's love never fails. Because his love is steadfast, we can always return to it and begin again. We can grow in confidence as we grow from being spectators of that love to participants in that love. Eventually, our hearts will no longer condemn us, and we will be made perfect in the confidence of God's love and perfectly rest in the fact that we live and move and have our being in his love. And in that moment, we will be at the feast. As St. John writes, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of Jesus Christ, his son, and love one another as he gave us commandment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.